So I have 135 now, so um, we can get started. So uh, thank you everyone. Um, so we'll start our session five, um, which is actually um, genomics in a fragmented healthcare environment. And our uh, co-moderators for this session is Dr. Freemuth and Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Ginsberg. Uh, Dr. Freemuth is an assistant professor um, of biomedical, inform biomedical informatics at the Mayo Clinic Center for Individualized Medicine. Um, he's also the co-chair of several work groups, including HL7's Clinical Genomics Workgroup and the GA4GH Genomic Knowledge Standards Workstream. Uh, Dr. Freeman's uh, research program focuses on developing scalable methods, tools, and infrastructure that facilitate the translation of genomic data to clinical practice with an emphasis on knowledge management and delivery, and as well as the development of data and terminology standards. Uh, Dr. Ginsberg is the founding director of the, for the Center of Applied Genomics and Precision Medicine at, the, at Duke University Medical Center and for MedEx, which is a partnership between schools of medicine and engineering to spark and translate innovation. His research addresses the challenges of translating genomics and digital health information into medical practice and the integration of precision medicine into healthcare. Uh, he was a member of the advisory council to the director of the NIH and a co-chair of the National Academies of Roundtable Academy's Roundtable on Genomic and Precision Health, and is also a founder and president of the Global Genomic Medicine Collaborative, which is a nonprofit organization aimed at creating international partnerships to advance the implementation of precision medicine. Uh, Dr. Freeman, Dr. Ginsburg, I'll turn everything over to you for the introduction of the panelists. Thank you very much, Ken. As Ken just described, this session will explore some of the challenges and opportunities related to the integration into and use of genomic data within a fragmented healthcare environment. This figure is from the NHGRI strategic vision paper that was published in Nature last October. And I think it's been shown at least twice already during this meeting. It illustrates the connection between basic genomics research, which generate large data sets from which new knowledge is derived and the translation of that knowledge into a nascent genomic learning healthcare system, which can build on foundational understandings at the molecular level to enable deeper understanding of the impact of genomics on a patient's health and the utilization of those data for clinical care. For this virtuous cycle to be possible, research is needed to address critical gaps and limitations within clinical electronic systems. Next slide, please. We have an august panel of speakers for this session. Marilyn Ritchie will discuss some strategic opportunities and challenges to using genomic data in a clinical environment. Sandy Aronson will outline a complementary set of barriers to information exchange. And Ken Kawamoto will identify challenges and provide recommendations for scaling solutions through interoperable standards. We will have time for only a short question or two after each presentation, but we will have a more in-depth panel discussion at the end of the session. Our first speaker, if you could bring up her slides, please, is Marilyn Ritchie, who is director of the Center for Translational Bioinformatics and associate director for bioinformatics in the Institute for Biomedical Informatics at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. And she is the associate director for the Penn Center for Precision Medicine. Dr. Ritchie's research focuses on developing novel approaches for understanding the relationship between our genome and human phenotypes. She has an extensive bibliography of more than 350 publications, and she has received several awards and honors, including fellow of the American College of Medical Informatics. Marilyn, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the invitation to uh, participate in this wonderful meeting. Before I get into the the meat of what I want to talk about, I feel like I should start by giving you kind of two biases that are kind of part of my personality and my view on this topic that I'm going to talk about. One is that I am an optimist. And so while there are a lot of ways that using our genome for life is challenging and could be problem problematic, I'm talking about this and thinking about this from an optimistic view where I think that this is something we should be doing research towards, obviously the rest of us do too, or we wouldn't be participating in this meeting, but I'm gonna talk about the highlights of, as to why we should be doing this. And then the other is that um, some of the points that I'll make are not taking into consideration the regulatory elements around these, uh, these viewpoints and some of the ethics and 
really there are nefarious things that one could imagine could be done if certain things happen and we build these, this infrastructure for our genomic data to be available through our lifetime. I'm putting those things aside because I, what I wanna talk about is the research agenda and the research that we could be doing in this space so that we could move this forward and use our genomic sequence data throughout our lifetime, recognizing fully that there are ethics and regulatory challenges, but that's not what I wanna focus on today. What I'm gonna focus on is the research that we could do in order to enable this to happen. Next slide, please. So once upon a time, we would use genomic information and genetics in the clinic really in the context of someone presents to a physician with some sort of illness or disorder and genetic testing was ordered so that a physician could use that genetic information for a diagnosis or to develop a treatment plan. Next slide, please. But what we're moving toward now is a place where our patients have genetic information when they show up in the clinic, whether they've obtained that through a, a vendor and direct to consumer and they quite literally walk in with it, you know, a printout report or the data on a thumb drive, or the data are, are being aggregated because it's being ordered for something somewhere else. And then the data just exists. And so we have the information on patients. And I think we're moving to a place in the future where we could have data on every patient stored somewhere in the cloud. And instead of using it at the time to diagnose, perhaps we could be using it to develop prevention plans for our patients or screening paradigms for the patients. And if they do then present with an illness, we can use that for diagnosis and treatment. When we have this information accessible to the healthcare system, we have the opportunity to identify patients who are at risk of developing certain conditions. We could do deeper evaluations or deeper phenotyping of those patients based on their genetic risks. We certainly could imagine a time where we could identify patients to participate in genotype guided clinical trials. I think we're seeing a lot of evidence that for particular genotypes, there are medications that work in a, in a better way or a more effective way than other patient populations. So we could do genotype guided trials if we had access to the genetic information. And then we can also, and we are starting to see that we're returning information to patients about their risks of either developing disease or of adverse drug reactions. And this is, this is the future that in some ways and at some healthcare systems, this future is now, but this is the future that we wanna to get to. Next slide. There are a number of ways that we can imagine using our genetic information for healthcare throughout our lifetime. Certainly the Mendelian disease risk genes, many of those are used in children and as part of newborn screening. Many of those are also used later in life as we start to develop different later onset conditions that happen in kind of midlife and later in life. That information would be useful to healthcare providers. You know, when a patient presents kind of at midlife with a condition, being able to couple that phenotype with their genetic phenotype to actually make a diagnosis would be incredibly useful. This was a point in some ways that was brought up in the last session in the context of Heidi Ream's question, you know, what if someone did get exome sequencing to look to see if they had a particular variant in, let's say, a cancer gene, and perhaps they didn't have a variant, but perhaps they do have a variant that is important for epilepsy or for uh, a cardiomyopathy or an arrhythmia or Lynch syndrome. Some, uh, perhaps the testing, they were looking for breast cancer genes, but they identify something for a different type of cancer. But perhaps that information isn't necessarily being returned to the patient or the provider at the time, but years later, as the patient presents with a phenotype, and I think Lisa made this point in the chat, we would want to be able to marry that phenotype with this genetic information that we have. We need to have that data stored in the EHR and accessible to, in the way that a patient and a provider can understand it. Um, pharmacogenomics is the one that's most near and dear to my heart. That genetic information is useful when a patient needs to have the drug prescribed, but we would need to have that information in the electronic health record or available to the provider and or the patient in order to use it. And I think where we're heading in the future are these polygenic risk scores. I think there are a few traits where these are being used in the clinic currently, but I think that this is an area that will continue to expand. And if we had the genetic information accessible across all of our care providers, and they could use that to estimate what we are at risk for. And especially as we start to have additional medication 
comorbidities, environmental insults throughout our lifetime, those polygenic risk scores will get more and more predictive and be more useful if we have access to them. Next slide. So I think there are a number of opportunities for clinical informatics to conduct research in this space so that this can be a reality. One that is ongoing is the EHR or electronic health record systems. They are starting to build capacity to store genomic information as structured data. I am not the first person at this meeting who has said this, this has come up before, but this really is key. The variant data has to be structured such that it's machine readable, not just the PDFs you know, that we've done for many years. Um, one example of this is the Epic Genomics module. I should disclose, I guess I, I have no interest in Epic. I have no stocks in Epic. That just happens to be the EHR vendor that the University of Pen Pennsylvania is using. Next slide, please. But we've been working very closely with Epic to use the genomics module that they make commercially available in the context of our system, which is called PenChart, by building out this precision medicine tab. So the screenshot that you're seeing, I'm using with approval um, from Epic. So this is you know, a view of the EHR that you see with the different tabs in our system. So the Precision Medicine tab is a tab that we've built just over the last couple of years that captures the uh, genomic VAR files or the variant files, which enable you to have structured content. We've actually built this out with at least one uh, molecular lab. I think we're working on a couple of others right now, but the AMBRI testing lab, we have it built out that they can return the results as discrete elements using HL7 directly into our EPIC chart. And then genomic indicators are the, the knowledge, the interpretation of that variant in the context of the clinical data. And then the genomic indicator is what we use to build the clinical decision support. Um, we just published a paper on this in December in uh, genetics and medicine that I'm happy to put in the chat when we're done, the URL to that. Next slide, please. So the other opportunities before I talk about the challenges, you know, with clinical decision support, we can disseminate the relevant information to providers so that they can use it. I think that there's enormous potential in the clinical decision support if we do it well, and specifically for using it outside of medical genetics clinics. You know, the medical geneticists are trained to think about this. So this is that one group of providers who actually do get this content in medical school. Many other providers don't get this. And so we need to train them. One thought is leveraging the CDS systems and leveraging Epic if we do it well in order to teach the providers what content is relevant to them. It becomes very important not to have too many alerts because we all hear about alert fatigue. So we can't alert them to every, you know, every relevant pathogenic variant in a patient's chart, only the ones that are important in the context of the care that that provider is providing. I think the health information exchanges are another opportunity where relevant genetic information can be shared across health systems. That is one mechanism that information could follow patients wherever they go. I think Sandy is going to talk a little bit more about this in the context of genomics. I will say there are limitations and challenges to that, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes and or in just a minute. And as we get more knowledge, we need to be able to push that information forward. Next slide. So the challenges, there are many. Uh, clinical decision support, we need to build the genomic indicators that, such that they can be updated regularly and that the providers have it in a language that they understand. The health information exchanges, currently genetic information is not uniformly shared. Not all systems, especially depending on vendor, can access that information. But we do need a way to leverage these EHRs and have the content kind of passed from system to system, because as was mentioned earlier, some patients get specialty care at one clinic and primary care at another. And then the genome annotations. As we learn more knowledge, how do we make sure that that information is pushed to the people that need it? Next slide. The last challenges, uh, these are actually mentioned from the survey. So many of you answered these specific points. There are compute limitations around the costs of storage and egress from the cloud, that may only exacerbate health disparities if we don't develop approaches and mechanisms that allow us to, to use this data uniformly, whether you're at a community health system or elsewhere. And then the ontology standards around the phenotype and the genomic annotations. You know, we have lots of standards, but we need to do research that allows us to 
um, determine which ones are most adoptable across the different systems. And we have to get away from only the academic medical centers. These have to be adoptable at our rural clinics, at our community health centers. And next slide, which is my last slide. Just to summarize, I do think that there is a lot of positive research we can do by leveraging the vendors and the tools that they're building, but doing the research to figure out how do we get this to the providers in a way that they can understand how can we get the annotations updated regularly? Informatics can do this. We just need to develop the right paradigm in order to make it happen in a timely way and make it accessible to all. Those health disparity issues will only get worse if we don't find mechanisms and approaches to do this that are low cost and accessible to all. And with that, I will stop and uh, happy to participate in questions and the discussion later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Appreciate the talk. Uh, we have been taking some notes here. We've got a couple of questions that have come in through the chat and Jeff and I are uh, teeing some things up for the panel discussion at the end. We do have just a, a couple of minutes here for a couple of questions before we move on. And there, there are a couple of things I'd maybe like to highlight. Um, Aaron wrote in the chat here, uh, if you could comment a little bit further on the University of Pennsylvania's implementation here. Um, does, does that precision medicine tab that you're building out there work for clinical trials? And uh, to what extent does it support reanalysis? Oh, that's a great question. So I think the answer, short answer is yes, it could be used for clinical trials. Um, currently it's mostly being used in the context of clinical genetic testing. So within that tab, a physician is able to order a test. And so currently, they are ordering um, mostly from medical genetics clinics, but we have some ongoing research to figure out how do we get non-medical genetic specialty clinics to do those orders. So we are starting to think more about um, specialty clinics and primary care. And then for the second part of your question, the reanalysis, because the data are structured, they can be used for reanalysis. So we are doing a lot right now to analyze not only the variants that are in there, but the, the clicks that are happening through that tab to try to learn about how well it's being adopted, who's looking at the results, how are they using those results. Um, and based on that, actually, one of the things that we've just built that just got released this month is um, once a, a provider orders a test and the result comes back, instead of only notifying the provider, it's notifying the provider group and someone from that group goes into kind of this holding place to look at the result, look at the interpretation, and then make a decision to push it into PenChart for patient view. So it'll also go into my pen medicine or defer so that they can have a conversation, you know, between the genetic counselors and the medical geneticists or to um, not push that result forward. So perhaps, you know, there wasn't anything conclusive. And so rather than push it into the chart and confuse the patient, they keep it and do additional testing before it gets pushed to, um, to the chart. So we're starting to monitor that so that we can do research on it and learn you know, what's working and what's not working. Right now, as I said, it's mostly being used by medical genetics, although we have seen a few orders from neurology um, and uh, the hearing loss clinic. It's mostly been medical genetics, but we want to learn how do we get it out of medical genetics clinic. They know what they're doing. We need to get this information to the other providers that need it as well. That's great. Thank you, Marilyn. Given the, the time that we have here, I think what I would like to do is uh, reserve the rest of the questions that have been coming in here for the panel discussion. And so we will come back to as many of those as we can. Uh, as I mentioned, Jeff and I are, are carefully trying to record all these. So please keep the questions coming and uh, we, will, we will get back to as many of those as we can. Uh, our second speaker for today is Sandy Aronson, who is the Executive Director of Mass General Brigham Personalized Medicine Information Technology. His teams are focused on both supporting clinical genetic testing and on using technology to improve clinical processes, partnering with clinical leaders to redesign clinical workflows to reduce cost and improve outcomes. Sandy was a founder or co-founder of several companies, including Gene Insight, which provides him with a dual perspective on challenges and solutions for genomic medicine. Sandy? Thanks, Bob. Can you hear me? Oh, can you hear me? Yep, you're just fine, oh, thank you. Oh, great. Um, so I have really been enjoying this conference and I hope to add in a small way to some of the concepts that have been brought up um, while talking about 
why the heck do we not yet have a broad clinical genetic information exchange? And more importantly, what do we have to do to make sure that when we do have one, it will help rather than harm health equity? So just a quick, uh oh, just a quick disclosure. Um, my employer um, does get royalties from sales of Gene Insight, um, which does include a, some um, health equity, uh, I, I'm sorry, health information exchange infra infrastructure. So the dream that many of us have been focused on, I'd say since about 2005, surrounding genomic information exchanges goes something like this. What if all of the clinical laboratories of the world could send structured genetic reports into an information exchange that would route those reports to any of the provider organizations that may order their tests and deliver them in structured form into the patient record where it would be combined with other clinical structured data. And not only that, but where the world's knowledge repositories would also be integrated into this exchange so that whenever there's a change in variant knowledge, change in gene knowledge, that would be sent through the exchange, delivered to the provider, hybridized appropriately to the patient record. Those things would come together and we develop clinical decision support that delivers the power of genetic knowledge right into the, um, the point of care, improving care, but also giving us the ability to constantly learn from this combination of genetic data and clinical data so that as we improve our genetic knowledge, that knowledge will pull back to the genomic repositories, be distributed through the genetic knowledge exchange throughout the world, thus sparking the continuous learning, genetic aware um, health information system and delivering the greatest improvements to human health that we've ever seen. That's the dream. So what's the reality? So the reality is to the best of my knowledge, every one of these exchanges that exist now that's, that lives in the clinical world is small. And why is it small? It's small because every time an institution, a stakeholder wants to connect to one of these exchanges, there is a cost. There's a cost to set up the connection and there's a cost to maintain the connection. Vendor infrastructure, standards, best practices can all help a great deal but there's still always going to be a cost. And the reality is that the number of institutions, if you include physician practices, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of institutions. The only way that we can ever fund this is if those institutions in mass start to decide to invest their own dollars in connecting to these exchanges. So what do they need to believe in order to do that? Well, first of all, they need to believe that it's gonna be technically feasible for them to do that. And I think that eMERGE 3 provided a great deal of evidence that yes, this is technically feasible. Second, they need to believe that this is gonna deliver clinical benefit to specific patients, that the decision-making, if they invest in this infrastructure, IT infrastructure, it's actually gonna change the decisions that they're gonna make and that's gonna improve patients. Lots of work been done on that. I think that as others have mentioned, I think that the real, that, that the biggest hurdle here is financial viability. That if they make this investment that, and maintain this investment, that there's gonna be some other source of dollars that's gonna come in that's going to pay for it. And once they've gotten over all of those hurdles, they have a potentially viable project, but that project needs to be prioritized against every other potentially viable project that is a priority for them. So how does this value proposition for that prioritization lay out? So I think if you look at it for clinical laboratories, I think there's a strong argument, always hard to, to free up dollars, but a strong argument for the laboratories. It's going to make their tests more powerful for their customers, and it's gonna differentiate them relative to any other laboratory that is not on the exchange. What about the knowledge repositories? I'd also argue that knowledge repositories, their fundamental existence is based on disseminating knowledge. So I think that there's a strong value proposition for them too. The challenge really lies on, or I think the largest challenge lies on the provider side and the value proposition 
for the providers. And perhaps the most important point that I'd like to make is if we think about this, if there is, a lot of us are from value, uh, are from institutions that have, that may have very narrow margins, but have margins that are larger. And we can invest in cutting edge things that don't have an immediate payback. But if you think about institutions that are operating on no margin or negative margin and having to make the decision on whether to invest in this kind of infrastructure, they can only do it if there is an immediate source of dollars that is going to be generated as a result of that investment. So if we can't deliver that value proposition for them, we're not only creating a situation where the patients of that institution won't be served, but we know that often the clinical use of genetics drives a great deal of the research use of genetics. So we're we're excluding that patient population from certain forms of research and, and, and increasing the risk of that research being less equitable. So the cost and, and like hard economic math of these value propositions, I think actually has a significant impact on equity as many others have mentioned um, as well. So what does this value proposition look like for providers? Well, there's cost and there's value. So fundamentally the cost comes down to, you have to pay for establishing the, the, the IT infrastructure, you have to pay for maintaining the IT infrastructure and you need to pay for maintaining, establishing and maintaining the clinical processes, the changes to the clinical processes that are gonna use that IT infrastructure to actually deliver the value that you're seeking to deliver, the new clinical services or capabilities that you're seeking to deliver. So what does the value proposition look like? So when, what I find in, 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 in my role is that the value proposition for people who actually control the spend of clinical dollars, every one of them really wants to do what's best for patients. They really want to consider things like what will reduce the total cost of care for that patient over time. But the actual numbers that they have to make pencil in order to make their budgets work often come down to things like patient acquisition. Will, will providing this service lead to more patients coming to the institution? And what will the effect be on either fee-for-service revenue or value-based care metrics, get, which get complex to, um, to play against each other? Within our institutions, often grant revenue and, and things related to thought leadership will often will come into play as well. Um, but I think that we need to keep in mind that for many institutions, those aren't drivers of dollars. And therefore, that this can bias us towards infrastructure that's more accessible for us than for, um, than for other institutions. So what suggestions um, can, can, can I make, um, put forth for research? So there, there are three. What, what I'd suggest is that it would be really useful to convene form, forums of the provider economic decision makers to ask them what types of genetic services, what types of genetic use cases would excite them enough such that they would love to invest money in them so that they could provide those services and what value levers would those services move in order to generate that excitement. And I think that the type of people that we'd really benefit from talking to are people like CEOs, COOs, CFOs, chief medical officers, chief marketing officers, both from large institutions with reasonable margins and also from small institutions, ideally with some representation from some of them with negative margins. And I think that that would help us identify what types of functionality we could focus on, what types of genetic services we could focus on that are most likely to be adopted. And then we can think about what types of research is most likely to give rise to the development of those services and the killer apps that could actually be the apps that, that, that would drive people to spend money in order to implement them. And then that would open up the possibility for really exploring, okay, what are the clinical workflow and economic barriers 
to the IT support that folks most want in order to um, expand their clinical services and offerings. And this is a place where I think standards can really come into play, where we taking the broad standards that are intended to be generally applicable and really making sure that we make them extremely robust for the specific kinds of apps that we hope to make as cheap as possible for folks to, for folks to implement. I think that these types of things be enormously difficult to, um, to execute on, but, but I do think that they could help create a path towards developing a, um, a, a path for creating a much broader and, and more equitable um, genetic information exchange infrastructure. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Sandy. Great talk. Thank you for all those ideas. Uh, there have been a couple of comments here in the chat. Um, and one question by uh, Jeff. Jeff, would you like to chime in on this? Okay, great. Uh, that was a wonderful talk. And um, my comment in the chat, you answered after my comment to some degree, but it really is defining the short and long-term uh, you know, value propositions as well as how uh, do, does this integrate with value-based care. But I, I wanted to, um, in, instead of asking that as a question, I wanted to really endorse your idea of bringing the leadership together that have to make the financial decisions and also to include both leaders and Luddites. So we have the ones that have actually taken the risk and have shown maybe some ROI to, to the investment and ones that don't know where to start and why they should even be paying attention to this. And having that as uh, some of the, um, the stakeholders that are going to really receive the value of the research agenda um, I think it's critically important. So I'm really happy that you raised that. And I hope Mark and Ken will uh, take that forward as a, as a potential action item is to and really have a convening that you mentioned. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. And I do think the, the, the fact that the value propositions will be different for different institutions, I think it's been a theme of this conference and, and also an important thing for us to consider and make sure we have that diversity in doing that. Thanks, Sandy. Um, it, I was struck by your final points regarding the economics and uh, the way I interpreted it was the need for carrots in addition to sticks uh, to motivate that institutional investment. Do you see any parallel between those challenges and the ones our domain faced regarding the cost of sequencing prior to the development of next gen sequencing technologies? Do we need a similar revolutionary advance in clinical informatics methods and technologies rather than incremental ones to break through those challenges and get to the point where clinical genomics infrastructure and tools can be widely and cheaply deployed and integrated into clinical environments? You know, Bob, my take on that is that clearly that would be very helpful and, and that would be awesome if it occurred. But I think that, I think it's important for us not to focus just on that because I think that the, the, the other side of it is what are the services that are going to, you know, sort of fit into the world as it is as opposed to the way we would like it to be in terms of generating enough value for institutions to offer. And I think that comes down to understanding what kind of genetic services do we think we, do we, think we could enable institutions to offer that they could actually get reimbursed for. And then, and then driving down the cost of those services, I think becomes critically important, but, but we need to understand that there's a revenue model in addition to understanding how we control the cost. Great, thank you. Um, I think there's there's one more question that came in the chat here. Um, I think I would like to uh, to propose it to you, Sandy. And if it's something you'd prefer to defer to the to the panel discussion at the end, we can do that. Um, it's from Gail. Uh, she asks, "How does the movement of patients into and out of health systems, depending on things like their job and insurance, affect the value proposition? Are there yeah, any potential solutions?" This is critically important because I think that we often feel like if we can reduce the total cost of care of caring for a patient over their lifetime, that that should be attractive to providers. And providers want to deliver that value, but that value does not always accrue to the provider. It doesn't even necessarily accrue to the payer. Um, 
and or it, it, the dynamics are complicated relative to the to 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 the payer. So so we need to find, and that's where I think we need help understanding what services will generate return in the current environment that will also deliver that kind of value to society. Great, thanks so much, Sandy. Our final speaker for this session is Ken Kawamoto, who is Associate Chief Medical Information Officer of the University of Utah Health and Vice Chair of Clinical Informatics in the University of Utah Department of Biomedical Informatics. At the University of Utah, Dr. Kawamoto leads the Reimagine EHR Initiative, which is a multi-stakeholder effort to enable standards-based interoperable applications and software services to improve health and healthcare. He has developed some very impressive clinical applications and has earned recognition for his work. Dr. Kawamoto is also a member of the US Health IT Advisory Committee. Ken, looking forward to your talk. Take it away, please. Awesome, thanks. Uh, can folks see my screen? Yep, looks good. Excellent. Well, it's it's really great to be here. And this has been, uh, you know, I think we've been all zoomed out, but this has been actually one of the most interesting meetings I've uh, attended in the past, I guess, year now. So uh, thanks for everyone organizing this. I, 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 I think it's it's been great and it's nice to see so many folks that we haven't seen for a long time. It's it's kind of crazy and and uh, Jeff was one of my uh, key mentors when I was at Duke doing uh, NHRIK. So it's uh, it's great to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the standards around fire that um, I think are. Um, uh, important and relevant here, and then uh, talk a little bit about some of our experience using these standards in individualized medicine and uh, touch on opportunities and challenges. I'm going to probably go fairly quickly through this so that there's more time for discussion, but um, if anything's unclear, please just holler and I'll, I'll stop. Uh, just as disclosures, um, I have uh, honoraria consulting, sponsored researching, research licensing, or co-development in the past year with Hitachi, Pfizer, RTI, UC San Francisco, MD Aware, and the U.S. Office of National Coordinator for Health IT of Air Security Risk Solutions. Uh, I was also until recently an unpaid board member of HL7 that develops a lot of these standards I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm an unpaid member of the U.S. Health IT Advisory Committee, and I've helped develop a number of tools which we may commercialize. Okay, so I'm gonna start kind of here, right? Like, why are we even talking about standards? And I think it's kind of obvious, but I think these are at least to me, the some of the main reasons. So I think for discovery, uh, there's a lot of value in having normalized data sets for, uh, for being able to do science on it, right? So I think that's uh, really important. And for clinical care, uh, we need to uh, figure out scalable ways that we can optimize care at the patient level and population level. And the desirable feature of standards is there's an opportunity to say, if we do it this way, it won't. we can do it in such a way that it won't work just at our health system or just on the Epic EHR, but it can work on the Cerner EHR, it can work on eClinical Works, it can work in federally qualified health centers. So that's the idea and the hope of using standards. And I think what's also important to note is that there's a lot of synergies that can be achieved by using the same standards in the research realm, in the discovery realm, and the clinical application realm, right? Because the data, uh, Sandy was mentioning too, like the data is being generated for clinical care. And if we use different standards, it won't talk with each other. So I'm going to uh, just briefly talk through some of the relevant standards. So for a lot of folks, this is probably going to be too basic, but uh, bear with me. I'm just going to uh, make sure we're all on the same level. So FHIR, Fast Healthcare Interoperability Standards, is an HL7 standard. Uh, it allows us to exchange health information. I think the key parts here is it's gaining rapid industry adoption, right? We've had standards forever. The key difference, I think, is this one's actually being adopted in health systems and EHR vendors. Uh, and it's endorsed by NIH, which is always good for grants purposes, right? Because, you know, NIH says specifically we endorse it. There are several versions, um, uh, really not too much to worry about there. Uh, and what there are no, things known as IGs or implementation guides. So folks oftentimes don't realize, but like you can use fire to in a standards compliant way, say, you know, my car is a Toyota. It has, you know, six cylinders and my wheels are 19 inches and I have the, you know, luxury leather package. Like that is a fire compliant, you know, message you can create like it's that loose the what you what allows it to actually be interoperable is what are known as the igs and what's most important 
is, you know, we proliferate a lot of IGs, but the only one currently that is universally adopted and the and actually is enshrined in regulation is must uh, uh, that needs to be adopted is something called the US score IG. Uh, and it's required as a part of this uh, US score data for interoperability notion. So this is, I would, I would keep in mind that like a, a key goal should be to get whatever is important to this community into the US CDI if possible. And like I was chatting earlier, like a lot of, there's nothing genomics really, even in the common stage, right? And, and we can create all the IDs we want, but if we are the only ones implementing it, it'll have limited impact. Uh, Smart on Fire is related to Fire. It's basically a way to uh, embed third-party apps into the EHR. Uh, this allows like what Sandy was discussing as like the, these killer app notions. And again, the really interesting thing is this has wide, widespread EHR uh, vendor support. So that's key, right? Like there's been a lot of ways to do a lot of similar things. The key thing is vendors are actually adopting this. It also supports patient-facing apps like uh, Apple Health. Uh, it uses OAuth 2 to delegate users' data rights to an app. Uh, you, you read and sometimes can write data. And I'll talk a little bit about some other standards that can be used within these to uh, encapsulate your logic. Uh, and in some cases, like on the Epic EHR, you can augment the EHR fire server to add needed data or to filter out unnecessary data. Uh, in our uh, in institution, for example, we have about eight people on our team certified to build new interfaces into Epic. So basically, if you can see it, we can pull it. Right, but you know that's not always going to be the case in other EHR systems. Uh, CDS hooks is another fire-related standard. Uh, it's been a standard since 2019. There's increasing adoption. Epic does uh, adopt this and adopt it pretty well. Uh, so you can use this in within your rules engine, uh, and it's a companion standard to Smart on Fire that's meant more for suggesting things. So, for example, if you place an order, you can invoke a CDS hook service through uh, the best practice advisory framework. Uh, in Epic, and you can uh, retrieve data and provide guidance back, like, hey, change them to, to this, you know, order this medication, um, order this genetic test, uh, et cetera. Uh, there's also something known as the clinical quality language. This has been an HL7 standard since 2015. Uh, and uh, uh, is starting to get widespread use, I'd say primarily because uh, CMS is requiring this for their electronic clinical quality measures. And it allows you to do things like express computable phenotypes, doesn't support logic and clinical quality measures. So for example, for the eMERGE work in uh, computable phenotypes, it probably, I would think, should be expressed in CQL. Uh, there's an, uh, the last standard I'll briefly talk about is called FHIR Bulk Data Access or Flat FHIR. So this uh, addresses the issues that most FHIR use cases uh, to date has been a per patient uh, access. Um, and that's just way too slow for population level data retrieval, right? Uh, for example, for research purposes. Uh, and this is intent to address this issue. And this could allow you, for example, to get normalized large data sets um, uh, using the standard. The main issue here is this is still in development. It's still early on. I think this could have a breakthrough impact on this field. It's just fairly early. Okay, so with that, I'll uh, transition to just uh, talking a little bit about how we're using this uh, and share some of our experiences at the University of Utah. Uh, we started a multi-stakeholder initiative uh, about five years ago, I guess, uh, to leverage this and other related standards to try to improve care value. Uh, uh, there's institutional investment of about a million dollars a year we put into this. Um, so with this, we've been an early leader spanning research and operations. Uh, and I think what's been kind of unique here is that we have a really agile, collaborative, innovative environment. You know, some would call it wild west, but it's really easy to do things that would take much longer than elsewhere I've, I've learned. Um, and with this uh, and our uh, steering committee uh, co-chaired by our CIO and CMIO, uh, to date we've uh, deployed over 10 solutions into clinical practice uh, using these. And uh, right now we're uh, a little over $35 million in grant funding. So that just, I'm just going to briefly run through a few examples, which I think uh, kind of illustrate um, how these things can work. And these are all systems that are in clinical use now at our health system. So this one uh, it uses the Smart on Fire dashboard. Um, it's a collaboration with Hitachi. Uh, and what we did was try to address the issue for diabetes. After you give metformin, it's really not clear what to give in most patients, right? It's kind of a coin flip. So what we did is we uh, created uh, uh, predictive models based on our data and the state of Indiana's data and uh, created pretty good predictive models. And now you can access within the system uh, information like, hey, for this patient, you know, for an A1C goal of seven in uh, six months, uh, if you just continue on metformin on the left-hand side with the blue bar, you can see it's about a third chance that they'll be able to reach goal. 
Uh, if, if they lost 5% of body weight, it, it actually doubles it. If you add sulfonylurea, it's about 50%. Uh, GLP-1, it's about 80%. But then GLP-1 costs a lot more, and we have insurance-based information that we provide as well, saying, hey, this patient's on Blue Cross Blue Shield, and this is what it looks like for them. Here's another one for uh, lung cancer screening. Uh, this is an, uh, based on ARC R18. Uh, and the issue here is uh, low-dose chest CT screening for lung cancer could save more lives than breast cancer screening, but uh, current screening rates are pretty abysmal, and shared decision-making uh, is really important because the individual risk is very different, and it's actually required by CMS for payment. So what we do here is we pull in uh, all the patient's uh, relevant information and provide patient-specific risk assessments that can be actionable, and it looks likely that this is going to end up being in the EPIC foundation system, uh, so then it'll be available to all EPIC customers uh, kind of as a natural course. Uh, this final one is on a population basis. Uh, this is for uh, fire-based population health management. The goal here is to identify and manage individuals at elevated risk of breast or colorectal cancer. Uh, this is an NCIU 24 where Guilherme Delfiel, my colleague, is the contact PI, I'm co-PI, and has led to another NCI uh, Moonshot Initiative grant. Uh, but the issue here is, you know, over 10% of us are at elevated risk for these early onset breast colorectal cancer. And, you know, and usually we're unaware, right? Um, usually just a tragedy that something happens and it's like, well, well, it's more than that. We have all sorts of data we're capturing in our systems to be able to identify it. So what we're doing here is uh, using a, a bulk fire type approach to gather data on our entire population, running it against uh, uh, CDS hook services, identifying risk for, and it turns out there's thousands and thousands of uh, patients who are at, at increased risk that, you know, currently we're doing nothing about. And we're uh, using uh, uh, techniques like chatbots to automate the, uh, the genetic counseling and genetic testing processes. And, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's quite doable. And it's, it's it, I think, you know, it makes sense to, uh, to do things when we have the data rather than just um, uh, uh, doing what we currently do, which is generally uh, leave it uh, really hit or miss approach. Okay, so uh, with th that's just a brief summary of some of the things we worked on. Uh, I'm just gonna transition real quick to challenges and some thoughts. So uh, what are some of the key challenges you run into, right? So as with everything, a lot of it's about the data. Data normalization is key, right? Like that doesn't like magically disappear when you start using fire. Um, it, it does in some areas, but in most areas it's like, well, if the data is not clean or data is not mapped, Data is not clean, data is not mapped. So that's a key one. Another one that typically a lot of folks uh, underestimate is execution performance. Some of these standards and their implementation by EHR vendors are pretty slow. So for example, in some uh, APIs in Epic, if you wanna pull the patient's past medications, like even like hey, asking the question, did they get prescribed something that's getting canceled today? It can take like 10 seconds to pull, right? Obviously those are huge issues when you're looking at clinical use. Uh, EHR vendor support also uh, and standardization is uh, currently mostly just in the basics, right? So, you know, great if it's supported and if it's not, you know, it's like it doesn't really help you. So these include detailed clinical models. And I mean by that things like, well, it's great you can get the office BP, but can you tell how they did it? Was it an AOBP? Well, and it's, you don't automatically get the home BP or the 24 hour BP, those kind of things. There's basically zero genomic support, and at the current state, you know, it's not. It, it's at least in the way the standardization is going. I think it, it's a long ways away, and probably something that uh, th this community can accelerate. Uh, and there's very little in the way of population-based approaches that support in a standards-based uh, manner. So as soon as you move out of uh, patients in clinic, I want to do something with the patient, and more, I you know, I want to survey them for risk and recommend, for example, you know, that they guess, get this genetic test. It it, it starts breaking down. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the last mile of translating into practice, because this, and especially when it's translating into practice outside of a clinical trial context, because every, all the things Sandy brought up comes into play, like, well, who's going to pay for it? Why would they do this? Why would they do this rather than buy another MRI machine and run a bunch of scans and get their money back in a year? You know, those kinds of things. Uh, so some recommendations, um, I'd recommend uh, coordinating and synergy, synergizing with the broader health IT community, right? Like, um, it, it's just such a common thing in the standards uh, realm in particular. We tend to like to build our own standards and criticize the other standards for like not thinking about us enough. But you know, we'll, we'll get beautiful standards, but then nobody will implement them. So I think 
key key here in particular is how can you get the stuff needed for this community into the US core um, uh, fire implementation guide. I think that that should be a central thought in, in this community if, if, if you want it to be widely adopted. Uh, we also need to recognize the hard problems largely persist, right? Like, you know, <laughs> fire has gone wide adoption by promising it's super simple and it's super simple to create a test application, but if you want to do something real, it's actually still hard. So I, I think that that's a message, right? Like it can't be like, oh, we have fire. Like, you know, we like now it's a totally easy IT issue that it totally is not. Uh, and then we need to uh, work together to accelerate key need development. So for example, the US core data for interoperability, some of the key criteria are it's implemented in multiple health systems uh, across multiple EHR platforms, and that will elevate it in the promotion process where it, it will then come to committees like the committee I'm on that evaluates these to say, should we consider making this a national requirement? Right, and so there's uh, there's a lot that can be done to basically force the hand of regulators to say like, hey, at this point, like this is proven, it, it needs to be done. Um, and then uh, of course we need to facilitate the full translation life, life cycle, including the last mile of clinical implementation because I know it tends to kind of go by the wayside in, in a lot of scientific institutes, but I, I think, you know, and obviously the whole life cycle is important, but uh, in the end, I think we need what we're developing to be used. Okay, so that's it. And I think I'm actually a little bit over time. So thank you very much. That's great, Ken, thank you. Uh, we are right at time, but I do have one question that came into the chat that I'd like to toss your direction before we turn it over to the panel discussion. Mark writes, implementation guides are very interesting. Regarding genomic applications, could creation and deposition of an IG be required or strongly suggested as part of the dissemination, implementation, and data sharing plan? Uh, I'd say probably not. Um, so, um, I mean, the IG first the tooling is kind of a painful and there's only a few people who actually really know how to do it so it could be really really frustrating for people who don't know how to do it right like i believe and at least until recently it still might be the case it's like excel spreadsheet based to build websites like just imagine that for a second right um i i would say no but um uh, i think the notion of you know how are you going to i i I wouldn't say a requirement, but maybe even just like asking people if it's getting into the applied side, how are you gonna use standards? How does it synergize with available standards? It's probably a useful thing to ask. Um, but uh, yeah, the challenge with standards is it's really complicated, it's really deep, and you need really specialized folks who you know attend weekly calls and follow all these things and review ballots. And I know Bob is one of those folks, but there has to be a way to scale it because it's oftentimes not possible for a regular, like, you know, um, researcher in this field to spend the this, this efficient time to be truly expert and engaged in that area. Thank you very much, Ken. I, I completely concur with your assessment there. Uh, it is hyper-specialized and, and very tricky. Um, I would like now to turn the platform over to Dr. Jeff Ginsberg, who will moderate the panel discussion. Jeff? Thanks, uh, and that was great. And I, I can't resist uh, quoting Mark Williams, uh, who has been known to say, the problem with standards is that there are so many to choose from, or something like that. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so we, yes, we're gonna have about 20 minutes uh, for panel discussion. Um, there's, a, there's already a question from Richard Gibbs um, for the panel, which uh, was, is that uh, with various uh, health information exchanges that are, is this a logical place where genomic standards should enter the ecosystem and how could this happen? And I'll ask uh, as many panelists are, who are able and willing to respond to, to these questions to do so. Uh, go ahead. No, well, it makes sense. I, I don't know if health information exchanges currently do actually exchange genomic information, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it seems like a reasonable place to start. Yeah, I mean, my, my feeling is it really has to start with the provider side use cases to like define what the genomic information is gonna be used for. And then I think the genomic, the, the health information exchanges can, can play a really important role in delivering that data. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, for our implementation at Penn, we don't currently push genomic information through the health information exchange. So as I mentioned earlier, we're an Epic shop. And so Epic Care Everywhere is the HIE that we're using. 
we could have turned on genetics, but we didn't. And at least to start with, that was by design because we're already trying to make sure that the providers that are local know what to do with the information. We don't want to push information out to providers who don't know that it's coming and don't know what to do with it and don't have the the interpretation and the content there for them to use it. And that it's partially also, I guess, a liability issue. We don't want to put something in front of a provider that they can't use, but then we've also punted liability that now they have this information that they can't use. So that's something that we're trying to work through. How do we make sure that not only the content is there, but the interpretation and the how would a provider that doesn't know anything about genetics know what to do with it? Okay, thank you. And I want to mention that um, as I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and ask that um, as you answer questions, that you do so with your hat on as advisors to NHGRI and to Mark and to Ken about what the research agenda coming out of this meeting should be. Um, and I'd like to turn back to some of the challenges that um, Marilyn highlighted in the first talk. Um, and we don't have them all captured here, but you listed uh, the dynamic nature of genomic information and annotation, uh, the standards of content and the standards of interpretation, um, uh, the uh, subsequent use in clinical decision support. So first of all, uh, you know, maybe you could help us, um, I'm speaking to all of you, help us prioritize the research agenda around those features and um, also whether they should be um, sort of uh, uh, decoupled from each other or whether they need to be done sort of as one sort of one, one process. If you could, um, you know, begin to unpack that, that would be great. I'm happy to go first. Can you say one more time the, the unpacking of which two components? The, the uh, you know, the fact that we have a dynamic, um, uh, a dynamically changing uh, genome uh, annotation and interpretation uh, that has to then be put into some standardized format for access by the provider community and for CDS to use. Um, are those uh, three or four maybe separate uh, research agendas or is it really just one and how do we begin to approach it? I think it's at least two uh, research agendas. At least that's my, my knee-jerk reaction to it. I think one is the what is the content and that needs to be updated, so that annotation information. I think in some ways that is what ClinVar is intended to do. And one of the things that I haven't, uh, and this is my naivete, so someone here may know better than me, how they've done kind of in comparison with something like CPIC, where there are very specific guidelines that go with the, the annotation and the interpretation I feel like CPIC has done a, a really good job of, yes, here are these annotations and, and they do evolve over time, but then there's also, here's the interpretation of it. Here's what you do about it. What is the action that you take? I know that ACMG has a list of genes that we should focus on, but I'm not sure they have that same level. You know, PGX, it's a gene drug pair with guidance. Could we have something similar that, you know, ClinVar has this rich database of annotation could we have the, the annotation, the disease, and the guidance standardized and put into guidelines? And, and maybe it has been since I paid attention. It, it's been a while since I've really dug into the ClinVar data because I'm so focused on PGX right now. Um, but I do think there's that piece. And then there's the CDS that goes with it. I think those are separate people that build out the CDS. Certainly, um, and this is something Carol and I were just talking about in the chat, how you build it in a way that the providers can read it. And so we need to figure out what is the language that they speak? Because I think right now we're, we're almost experiencing a, a language barrier that the informaticians that have expertise in genomics speak a, a language and we're being driven by the standards that we're trying to use. That's not the speak that the providers use. And so we need to write the, the decision support in a way that we can understand it. I, I think that's a little different from the annotation itself. We can have a standard to annotate it, but then we have to build that interpretation engine into the English that that clinician speaks. Yeah, I, I really agree with Marilyn. And perhaps to, to say the same thing and coming at it from a slightly different angle, and, and I recognize that this is a huge generalization that isn't always true, but I do feel that often 
within the research agenda, the funded research, we're building, we're building infrastructure with the intention of enabling a thousand flowers to bloom. And, and I think that there's a need for focusing more on specific flowers and, and, and driving back into the infrastructure from, from the flower. So for example, like a specific flower, and I'm not a clinician, so this may not be the right, the right thing, but, but if there was a service that we wanted to make more broadly available, whereby if a cancer risk variant is found, we want to provide the IT support required to help ensure that that patient over their lifetime gets the necessary screening and that that's updated as our understanding of the implication of that variant is updated. If we, if, if we were to focus on something like that, then we can drive back into, okay, what do the standards need to be to support that use case? What does the knowledge infrastructure need to be to support that use case and really and, and really try to fund sort of more horizontally or vertically focused than horizontally focused. Which as an IT person, you know, I love the infrastructure stuff. Um, but but I, think, I think that, you know, sort of those end-to-end -end use cases are just really important to make it accessible. So can I ask Thanks, Andy. Sorry, uh, was that who, who it's, spoke up? It's me, it's me Ken. Oh. So um, I was wondering, we've talked a lot about the use of fire and uh, USCDI code, USCDI for, for in, this, in these two days meeting, but one thing that we still are missing is understanding how the fire can be used for research. And I was wondering based off of, you know, our, the, based off of what we already know about fire, where would be a good place for us to start to build evidence that fire could be used for research? Because I think that's how you move forward to actually address some of these things as far as transmitting data. But I don't know. I'd like to get feedback from this group. Like, if you had to come up with a research agenda for this, where should NHRI when it comes to working with fire and USCDI? Yeah, maybe um, I'll give it a thought. I mean, obviously, there's a whole bunch of research, right? Like, if it's clinical research and how you actually, you know, use these in practice, then it can obviously be um, uh, uh, important there because. You know, probably the first step is you develop the evidence that this is the right way to care for patients, regardless of if you're doing it with, you know, with an EHR or not, then, you know, figure out like, what are all the different ways you can do that. And then it's like, how do you scale it? You know, how do you make it uh, uh, economically viable? On the discovery side, I think the benefit of using something like FIRE is there's a lot of mapping activities occurring within institutions to make the data in FIRE um, uh, uh, mapped. So for example, you know, there are efforts in probably all of our institutions to map through the beaker lab mount module the lab components to be mapped to link codes and to be mapped appropriately. Well, if you use the fire interface to pull that data, it's going to be done. And a lot of those issues with data mapping for getting data for research and doing, running clinical uh, phenotypes, et cetera, would, would uh, uh, potentially go away. So I, I think it's, you know, use case driven. Um, but uh, I, I think uh, you probably just need to get folks together who uh, are trying to solve problems and kind of like Sandy's notion, right? Like first identify what you're trying to do. Don't start from the technology and the infrastructure, start from the problem you're trying to solve and then get the relevant folks together and say, well, how could we do this and, and then solve it? You know, one interesting opportunity that, that may have some, some good overlap between the clinical and the research realms um, is cohort selection. Um, so, so I think that there's an increasing, I think that you might've mentioned this Ken and some others um, over the course of the day. Um, there's on the clinical side, I think that there's more work being done now to like scan electronic health records for patients who are being suboptimally treated and, um, and, and develop those cohorts to act on. I think that that's the same kind of work that's often needed on the research side to, to, to recruit patients. So that may be an area uh, that could be focused on. Yeah, I like both both of your suggestions, both Ken and Sandy. The the one thing that I think it's tricky around the uh, the researchers 
is, um, and I think somebody said something in the chat, I think Kevin, your comment in the chat just sparked this for me. One of the challenges, so writing a grant on infrastructure to somewhere like NLM, there's innovation, we're gonna build this new widget and it's gonna do all these cool things. Writing the grant on, I'm gonna tweak, I'm gonna use Fire, which is this cool new technology, but somebody else already built it. And now I'm gonna do these like little tiny one-off tests is not innovative. It's part of what we need to do is take this technology and innovation that's been built and test it in use cases the, in just in putting on both my grant writer and a grant reviewer hat, they're gonna get dinged on innovation in terms of, cause people typically think of innovation as the cool new thing. It's not a cool new thing. So just something for us to think through, how do we do ask these questions in a way that allow us to get at the crux of the, the issue, recognizing that part of the innovation was the technology that's been built. So um, there's a lot of uh, uh, chat on the use case uh, topic coming up. So I, and Mark, uh, you, I think you you may have started this. So I'm going to turn it over to you. But I, I'd like, if possible, to marry the use case idea and agenda to Sandy's emphasis on the economic value proposition. Because if we can get a research agenda that actually tells us what to measure and how it will convince the ultimate stakeholders who have to support this. I think it would be a winner. So Mark, I'm gonna um, ask you to elaborate a little bit and see what the panel thinks about, you know, uh, if we can dr uh, drill down a little deeper on the use case idea. Sure, um, I just wanted to, um, I'll just comment a, just a bit on Marilyn's last point. I think that, you know, the point that you just made is one that uh, uh, NIH is well aware of. And I know that in a lot of study sections now, we are being told um, an ap application of a technology to a new area should be considered innovative, but it's taking a little while for the study sections to kind of pick up on that. But I think th that problem is recognized and hopefully will continue to improve. So the use case idea I think is really interesting. Um, and the thing that um, I like about it is in the, in the clinic uh, and in clinical in informatics, everything is based around use cases. Um, and use cases can be evaluated and prioritized in terms of where do we invest our resources. Um, so the question then is, could we um, base a research agenda on specific use cases that could be prioritized um, by, in this case, NHGRI? And then to get at the point that Jeff was raising, you know, what would be the criteria by which you could prioritize given use cases? And you could imagine you know, this is where you could engage with a variety of different stakeholders to kind of get their perspective on what would drive their interest in a given use case, whether it's um, uh, closing a clinical care gap, whether it's an economic argument, whether it's a patient-centered focus, whatever. But if you could actually prioritize use cases, articulate those explicitly, um, then you might get uh, research that would have a higher likelihood of kind of crossing from uh, the research uh, realm into the implementation realm. And, and if I could just add quickly to that, um, going back to the discussion we had earlier about con convening the sort of health system leadership and payers to be part of that conversation, to know sort of what's burning a hole in their wallet that maybe genomics and informatics could solve. Uh, that would be, um, you know, a, a more of a needs driven approach. Uh, we often are, um, I'm just uh, saying this from my own vantage point, we're often developing technologies that are looking for a solution or a problem to solve rather. And uh, maybe we need to flip the, the paradigm a little bit more than we have as a community. So um, Ken or Marilyn or, uh, or Sandy, do you wanna to respond to that? Yeah, maybe like I've thought about this kind of stuff a lot and you know, I, I've engaged in building like our cost accounting system in our health system, which was very interesting, right? Like you. <laughs> you figure out all how the money flows and and I think if you get the CEOs, CFOs, et cetera, you need the other, I think somebody said, right? Like I forget who mentioned, but it was like, you need those folks and the people who are really knowledgeable in this field to say, these are the, the case studies that show this can be done. Cause you get them together and they're just gonna say, well, tell me how I'm gonna increase revenue or reduce costs. 
Like that's right. And they're not gonna be like, maybe we can do this. No, <laughs> like, and then you would bring in the case studies and say, look what we've done at, you know, this amazing academic medical center. And this is how you, we think you, it could scale. What do you think? I, I think it would need to be that combination or it'd be a very quick kind of uh, conversation. Yeah, I, I agree with all of this. I think it would be incredibly exciting to base a research agenda or at least part of a research agenda on use cases. And I think, I think Ken's right. You have to see them. The, the decision makers aren't going to know what is possible, but they can react to what is the potential economics of what is possible. And, and I, I'll also highlight that I've been exposed to these clinical ROI analyses much more recently, and they are intense and complex and take a lot of time to do. And I, I think look very similar to a lot of things that we attempt to do on the research side. So it may be that there is a research agenda that includes investing and in generating those things because it's, it's not like we can just ask a, a CEO and have them and, 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 and have them be able to articulate that this will or will not generate a re return. I think they can provide guidance and then we can investigate whether they would create a return. Yeah, I, the one thing I would add, having the, the people from the C-suite at the table also helps broaden the perspective of what is, where do you want to see the return? So one of the things that we've experienced, if you have only the one clinic um, and you know the, the department chair from that clinic at the table, sometimes they're focused very much on their budget and what ROI would this have in my budget? Whereas if you get the CEO and the CIO and the CMIO, they're thinking about the whole system. And so there are bits of information that we're talking about here that might not help in cardiology, but are absolutely going to help in OB-GYN and in, car or in um, you know, pathology or somewhere else. So um, definitely that's what we've seen. Having those folks at the table has helped. The other is having researchers and providers and the IT folks all part of the conversation. I mean, that part of the way that this precision medicine tab at Penn happened is that we have a regular meeting that have not only the C-suite folks and the clinical providers and department chairs and the researchers, also legal and bioethics, we meet on a regular basis and talk about these things. And, and I think to Ken's point, it, it, they have to all be part of that conversation to be able to even drive those agendas and infrastructures forward. Yeah, I, I would note though, I mean, it, it's, it's not rocket science to know what you need to move, right? The things that will get CEO CFOs to to really pay attention is it increases revenue because like you provide the service in the outpatient, you get paid more than it costs you, right? Like it could be just you know you like if you just have that for genetic testing, you get paid more than it costs you, then that would really drive genetic testing, right? Or in the inpatient setting, it reduces your costs because you generally get paid by MSDRGs, which is fixed based on your diagnosis. And the sooner you can get the patient out or the less stuff you do for them, the more you make. It could be even things like other testing you would have otherwise done. Just do it you know, the day after they get discharged in the outpatient, which could make a several thousand dollar difference between doing it inpatient versus outpatient. Like the, the basics of hospital financing isn't like that's super complex. It's just like in the inpatient, generally we get paid a fixed amount, so reduced costs. And outpatient ED, we generally get paid more the more we do, unless you're in a valley based contract. So, you know, figure out ways to increase revenue. And that could be like you do a genetic test and you find that somebody has this, like, you know, really complex disorder that requires a lot of treatment. And maybe you just show that, look, like you do this and you get a lot more revenue and that's enough, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think that there's that there's many different types of use cases. There's there's functional use cases where you're providing a certain kind of functionality to everyone, and there's there's use cases that are intended to enable a new kind of service um, that you're going to offer. And when you're enabling a new kind of service, that's where I think those assumptions about okay, what additional fee for service revenue or impact on value metrics might occur associated with this. And, and their trade-offs where it really gets complex is 
you know, I think that many institutions now have both fee-for-service revenue and value-based revenue. And something that helps one can hurt the other. And you have to like play out what this actually means for the institution in that kind of environment. So the different use cases may have different complexity, but in general, I think that the field will get the most value from, from a research perspective on focusing on um, use cases that involve enabling new kinds of services. So thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna ask, uh, uh, I did ask Mark if I could ask one uh, quick, well, hopefully quick question, but it, I know it's a big one. Um, and it's orthogonal to the discussion we're having, but I, and maybe this will come up in the uh, later on. But um, uh, Eric Green emphasized the you know the need for a capacity building of the workforce and diversity, and I think the field of IT and bioinformatics and this group um, you know needs to weigh in on how do we actually do that um, because uh, you know we we, we don't have um, the pipeline that we need to to really. Um, enable what we've talked about over the last couple of days, and we certainly don't have it a very diverse one. So I'm curious as to whether, you know, each of you could have a lightning rod, you know, sort of 15 seconds of thoughts or 30 seconds of thoughts before we close the session. You know, I, I believe that in addition to hiring diversity, one of the problems that we have is we don't know how to design for equity relative to supporting the workflows that will actually make these services available to underserved and minority communities. And I think by focusing on that, there's the potential to develop relationships with those communities that then in turn help us with diversity and hiring. That's a really interesting idea. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, Marilyn or Ken, do you have any additional thoughts? Thank you. Um, Hi, Ken. You look like you're oh, no, I, I think it's always the case, right? Like, we have to start early, um, but this becomes more just like a societal thing. Like, in the end, we have to start with like, you know, early childhood education and child care support and all that kind of stuff. That being said, like, it is obviously hard. All of us are trying to like address this and it is super hard. Maybe one of the things that like a group like NHRI could do is just you know, take what's happening in every single department, every single program across the country, say in this area and figure out how can we like figure out ways to do that better together. Cause like it is happening everywhere, right? This is, this is a key issue everyone's trying to address. And it's like, I'm sure we're wasting enormous amount of cycles rethinking the same thoughts that somebody else already knew. Yeah, and I would say what I keep coming back to in my mind is how to use IT and informatics to reach people where they are. And, you know, can we, so certainly on the provider side, can we push content to them that they can understand? On perhaps the, you know, undergraduate side, we have all this content. Can we just learn from other educators? How do we take the content that we have and write it in a language that they can understand and then deliver it in the platforms they use? Perhaps we should be making more you know, educational videos on TikTok. That's what the kids are doing these days. So can you take these concepts and meet them where they are in the language that they're speaking? Wonderful, it was worth going over three minutes and 35 seconds to hear those um, important thoughts. And I wanna thank uh, Ken and Marilyn and Sandy for some for outstanding contributions and also Bob, my co-chair and helping me, um, helping us um, move the session forward. Now I'm gonna turn it back over to uh, Mark and to Ken. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful panel uh, discussion. Um, so this concludes session five. We now have an hour's break. So to give Mark and I some time to kind of pull all this information together for the next session. So we will reconvene at 3.50. Um, and thank you again. Mark, is there anything you want to add? Nope, but please come back and uh, ready to uh, discuss. Um, uh, there are a lot of interesting themes. We don't have a lot of time, um, but we'll uh, try and make sure that we um, have captured uh, all the important discussions. So thanks very much.